at nine o'clock. Um, let's wait just a couple minutes to see. You got anyone else logged in from elsewhere? Uh, I hope so. They're streaming, yeah. Hopefully. Yeah, from there. Yeah, but I think so. Uh, yeah, they, we've done an audio check already. <laughs> uh, gee, what a surprise. <laughs> yeah. All right. How do you know that? I'm trying to look. I see 10. Oh, it looks like 30. It sure does. <laughs> okay. All right. Waiting. I think we're going to go ahead and start because that won't tie you folks up and Welcome to everybody doing this via the webinar. Uh, what you see on my screen night, right now is the, I'm doing a shameless plug here for our newsletter that you all got another email last night from instructional design that said, gave you a couple uh, important tips about some things. It updated you about Kaltura and the My Media. That process is running right now. So look at those emails and also keep an eye on the newsletter because we do have important updates in here on, on things like this just in, we'll tell you things like what the hot scoop on the term courses and stuff. So we're going to try, instead of trying to send a ton of email out, we're going to try to keep a newsletter updated. And of course, this is currently running. I'll update this newsletter in a little bit. This was sent out on August 5th, but there, and it gives you some ideas about new content and so on. So, please take a look at this. And one of the other things that's really nice about this is as we finish our recordings, we, get, we are updating this with the actual recording. So you not only have a schedule, but you can come back in here and look at the recordings whenever you want, which is kind of handy. Uh, we don't have yesterday's in there yet. But as we finish them, we will put the recording links in here for you to refer to. And so, um, this is a good, I hope everybody takes advantage of the newsletter. I think it's a little nicer way to present information than to just always keep getting emails. And uh, also, we can update it on the fly with a few things like the recordings, you know, so it's not totally static. We hope to issue one once every month. So this will be the August one, and then we'll try to do a September one if we can kind of get caught up enough to do one. So that's a little bit about the newsletter. And um, for today's presentation, I want to point out to you that um, <clears throat> there is a handout available. And um, I have a paper copy of it, but here is the Finishing Touches handout. You can click to it, and then you can actually go get that handout, download it, print it. And this is kind of my agenda, part of my agenda for today. But the only place I've really got it posted because I want to try to encourage people to go to the newsletter is I'm posting it in the newsletter with the orientation stuff because that's a logical place to put it. Okay. All right. So let's go to my dashboard and get started. Rob, you have a question. You say newsletter. What am I looking for when I try to look it up on? If you go, uh, Rob wanted to know, how do I find the newsletter? We will send out an email once a month from the instructional design email. So watch for an email from instructional design at southeast.edu, and it will supply the link. Also, if you ever have had any, I mean, if you get email from us from instructional de design right now, uh, you will, there's also a link at the bottom of each, um, email let me see if i can do this and show it to you right here at the bottom mm -hmm. under the banner or under our information is the link for the newsletter and we will keep that current right now it's running on the august one and then when we get to the next one it will uh, be the september one um, and we will at some point want to go to we're going to put in the orientation course the instructor orientation course an archive of the newsletters so that you can simply go to the orientation course, go to the archive, and then click the link for whatever month you want to look at. So, and we'll have information coming out by that, but our information is primarily going to come from instructional design at southeast.edu and from Stephanie, our assistant director of virtual learning, because she puts out 
the main, mainly the administrative notifications and all that important business end. And we want people to really watch for her emails and the instructional design emails because I know you all get a lot of emails that it's kind of important to stay up to date on that stuff. Thank you. Okay. Um, we are going to go ahead and get started. And the first part is going to be about content organization. Um, I want to show you something really, really cool. Thanks to Brandon, our instructional designer in Lincoln. He's the one I think that first pegged this for me at least. Um, if you go into the course, and we're going to use this one as a demo course, and let's say that you went to your modules and you deleted a bunch of stuff that you want back, or oops, I deleted this item, I want it back. There is an undelete function in Canvas, and we haven't written the documentation yet about it because it's not official Canvas, and Canvas doesn't have official documentation. It's just that people who use Canvas have figured this out. And I did a chat with the Canvas people just the other day to say, when will this be official? And they said, we don't know. So it's kind of a, not a hack, but it's not an official Canvas thing. And we can't guarantee to you that it will always work, but it's worth a shot. If you make a mistake and delete something, here are two steps. Click the home button, go back to the home button so that at the, in your web browser bar, the last thing you see is your course number. You can see here it's 8273 for this course. Do you see that up here? No, right, right up here. Okay. All right, and then put a forward slash and type undelete, U-N-D-E-L-E-T-E. -E. And there are your deleted items. These are things that I recently deleted in this course. Okay, because I, thanks to Erin Cottle, shout out to her, she allowed me to grab one of her courses because we really don't have any real built courses that are like courses students will be taking. Ours are specialized, so she allowed me to do that. And I didn't want all the materials in her course, I just wanted some and I was deleting some things. But for example, uh, we can go here and restore this. So let me go back to modules first and show you what it looks like now. Um, I will, I'll do a demo. Let's just accidentally delete this module or delete it because we think we don't want it. And I say, okay. And I say, oh my gosh, I didn't want to do all that. I only wanted to do this one piece or I didn't want to do the whole module or whatever. You can go back to where? Somebody tell me. Home. Next step. Yeah, make sure you're at the course ID number is the last thing. You can't do this from anywhere else in your course. You have to be on the home. You do a forward slash, undelete, undelete. And then right now, it's right here, what I deleted. So I can restore that. I can restore this. So and we have a question. Yes. The question is, how long are things available in undelete? Um, oh, you know what? I forgot to look that up. Hang on just a second, and I can tell everybody that because I have a note from the people. Let me see where I put it. Undelete. Here's the chat. I know you can't read this, but. Um, Undelete should last, should show the last 20 deleted items in a course. There should not be a time limit on the items in there. Okay, those are the two things. And we will put this documentation in the orientation course as soon as we get a chance. This is, I mean, we knew about Undelete, but we didn't know about all the information about it. And I don't know that you all can see that screen. Is that on the screen or not? Brandon, can, I, can you see the chat? I can't. Okay, because I'm not sharing the right screen. Okay, let me go back here. Now, can you see it? Yep. Oops, let me close this and close this. So, right here, last 20 deleted items in the course, but there should not be a time limit. And if they do not have a dedicated guide to the topic, and he's apologizing. So, that is an out that might save you. Don't count on it, all right? Again, it's undocumented and not supported by Canvas, but it's out there. So let's at least give it a shot if you're really 
death threat, but don't, in a caught word of caution, delete with great care. Don't just delete. <laughs> I have a question. Yes. If you delete that module in the modules, it doesn't delete your assignments, though, that was in the module, correct? No. The question was, let me go back here. Somehow I kind of lost where I was. Oh, piddly. Oh, okay, I'm in Firefox, sorry. Another tip for everybody, use Chrome. Uh, we're finding out that with, and hang on a second here, I've got too many windows. I am apologizing, but all right, right here we are. Uh, use Chrome. The latest update in Firefox has been a little bit funky. I just had somebody walk in here this morning before the session started and ask me, why aren't there any courses on my dashboard? And she was in Firefox, and I asked her to try Chrome, and all was well. So whatever happened lately in Firefox is making it a little dicey. You all should have access to Chrome. It should be a link on your desktop, a shortcut. So I would recommend starting to use Chrome exclusively. Um, or if you have a glitch, go to Chrome. Definitely Internet Explorer and Edge are not supported. Firefox was supposed to be good. Safari for Mac users is supposed to be good. But lately, Firefox has been a little dicey. So I would suggest Chrome being number one. Now, let me go back to Kim's question. She said, if I delete a module, will the assignment still be there? I believe so. Because see, let's say you realize it's two, three weeks later, and that deleted module wasn't showing in those 20 items. Yeah. Then you can recreate your module but you wouldn't have to create right. all your assignments. I, I can't speak with great authority on this, but my best guess is it would recreate the module and whatever is in there, but it would have not deleted, if you delete a module, that it's unlikely that it deleted those assignments. And we can do a quick test drive on that and take a look. Let's go to the introductory activities. No, no, wait a minute. I'll have to relink those items. See here? It only restored the module and the module title. It did not restore the individual items in it, but those weren't deleted because they would be in assignments. Uh, right here, here's your introductions, you know, and so, and your pages wouldn't be gone. But your URL links would be gone because remember, URL links are only on the module page right? They're web links. And web links, now if you had a PDF link from your files, that will be there. But if you have a URL to Google or wherever, that's only on the content modules page and it will be gone. So you'd have to recreate that. Okay, but otherwise when you go back to your modules here, yes, you would have to go back in here and um, add whatever items you lost because they still are in here, okay? Like read before enrolling in my lab and mastering new right here. See here, so you would have to rebuild your module. Your links would be gone. So it's not gonna fix everything, but it's gonna give you a starting point. But if I delete this, all right? Uh, well, actually, if I delete it here, I'm just removing it from the, remember folks, we're on the modules page. So if I, remove this page from the modules page, it's not gone. It is still over in pages. It's just not linked on your modules page anymore, right? Does everybody remember that or know that? I, this is, I think, content organization. It's kind of key to understanding how to work your content and organize your content to know how the module behaves and how that whole modules page behaves. Because if you look here, we still have that document right here, read before enrolling in my lab, right? And so hang on a second here, I've got these Zoom controls in my way. Oh, try to move them without ruining a bunch of stuff. So if I go right here and delete, I am killing it from the course because I'm in the pages bin. If you delete from pages, if you delete from assignments, if you delete from discussions, if you delete from your files, if you delete from your quizzes, they are gone. 
your undelete might work. And since this is a dummy course, I'm going to delete this. And it warns you, you're deleting a page. It won't be available to you anymore. All right, it's been deleted. However, if we go back home and choose undelete, it should be right there. And I can put it back. It will restore it back to where? Pages. Okay. Does that make sense to everybody? So that's a little bit about your modules. It's really important to realize that your modules are, oh, let me see if I can get this to move, sorry. Is that showing up for everybody? It is, isn't it? No. One trick is um, just the wording. If it says delete, it's getting it out of the course. If it says remove, it's just hiding it out of the modules. That's true on everything except hyperlinks. Right. Brandon's making a very good point there, okay? Read the words. If it says remove, it's taking it out of the module. If it says delete, it's killing it, all right? Except for hyperlinks. You take a hyperlink out of the modules and the hyperlink is gone to outside websites, okay? That's a really important thing to know about your modules and understand. It's something that's a total departure from the way Moodle worked. And so it's kind of different to wrap our heads around it, but that is also why you keep all of these items over here hidden because you want them hidden, um, and be, right? Everybody wants those hidden. So make sure they are hidden. Uh, because you don't want your students going straight to your pages, straight to your files, straight to your discussions, straight to your assignments, straight to quizzes, discussions. You don't want them going straight there. So it's very important to keep these hidden because you want them to go to modules. You want them to work through their course from top to bottom, just like you did in Moodle, on the main screen, and the modules is your main content screen. So that's very, very important. Um, I want to ask, here's a question that I want people to explain to me. Does anybody know why modules is grayed out? So I was reading this first. Well, yeah, but why can students see anything in modules? Let's go to student view and find out. Here's another trick with your, and I know I'm digressing to some extent, but this is the student view. This is how I can tell what the students can go to. Can they go to modules? Down there. Well, that page has been disabled for this course. Okay. Anybody out there in streaming land know why we the student cannot get to modules? Why was it grayed out? Is the course not started yet? Course is published. Well, this course might not be, but why? Anybody know? Let me go over to modules. Maybe that'll give you a hint. What don't you see? Anybody know? The modules aren't published. If your modules are unpublished and there are no modules that are published, that will make that be grayed out. It is unavailable to students if it's grayed out. So that's a visual cue also that you haven't published everything. And if you go into student view, that's an awesome way to make sure that everything that you want published is published and it's available to students. So before you leave your course, and I know this is kind of jumping into finishing touches, but that's very important to go to your student view and to see that everything you want your students to see, they can see, and that they can't see the things you don't want them to see. So if we go back over to modules here, and if I publish even one module, okay, now I go home, I refresh, I should have, well, I thought I published it. Okay, that's published. Is student view still? Nope, I'm in the instructor view. That should have made the modules turn. Nope, I'm tricking myself. Brandon, do you have any ideas about why that's doing that? There you go. Course wasn't published. Oh. Caught myself. 
two different things in the module. You have to make sure, them. yes, you have to publish your content in your modules and you also have to publish the course. And so that's a little bit about that. So that's like the box that we had to check in Moodle before the course would show up. She said, is that like the box you had to check in Moodle to show your course? Yes, it was yeah. the pull down menu and settings. So that's kind of uh, two steps is to publish all the module items and then also publish the course. Hi. What are you talking about? We are doing a streaming session about finishing touches and content organization. Mm. Okay, so let's go back to, sorry, let me go to the dashboard. Let's get back into, let's go back to content organization. I would say that Almost everybody, if you're thinking about how to organize your content, how you want to get your course set up, and is my course set up right? Is this what everybody recommends? Your key content organization is going to be to go to the orientation course for instructors, okay? Go into the modules, and then go down to the section that says, Viewing masterpieces, get inspired by masterpiece courses. This is something that we developed in answer to the question from lots of faculty about, I'd like to see an exemplary course. All right, but an exemplary course for science is different than an exemplary course for English, is different from an exemplary course for business. So instead of trying to highlight individual courses, um, Amy spent a lot of time in here to try to build kind of generic examples of what's good in courses. So if you want to really delve into your content organization and figure out if you've got it right, you should go to the orientation course, instructor orientation course, and then go to the viewing masterpieces section and look at examples of home. So look at these and we'll go through them now and take a quick look. For example, this gives you an idea <coughs> about, <coughs> excuse me, about what makes a good course homepage. You can see that right here, right? Wish I could hide this Zoom stuff from you guys. I don't know why. Brandon, do you know how I can hide all these Zoom things that are sitting on my screen and in my way? Uh, I'm not seeing them in the presentation, so it's you just not. Over here. Okay, thank you. Okay, because they were showing up on my screen and I was concerned that it was covering things for the people that were. All right, thank you. All right, so here's an example of what a good homepage should look like, right? You should have the course banner, you should have this content below here, and you should also have at least your name. We're finding out in the provision courses it does provide the course number very readily. So at a bare minimum, you should have your instructor name in here. And so this should be the first thing you see in your courses. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in finishing touches. But if you hit the home button, this is what you should see. If you don't see it, you haven't got your course right and you need to set your home page. And I'll talk about that later in finishing touches. Here's a sample of a good syllabus page. There are some summary points that tell you what you need to look for in your own course for organization. And then it also shows you a screenshot of what a good course summary, uh, a syllabus page should look like. Remember everybody, for content organization, the syllabus page is, or the syllabus area, the link that you click syllabus in your course navigation menu, that is for your administrative details of your course, your bookkeeping details like your syllabus. If you wanna add a timeline to this, you could add your timeline. If you have other like generic details that are not content related, but information for students, you would link it on the syllabus page. The reason that we're going with this is so that students know where to find the basic course information and not course content. So we had all those introductory materials in Moodle. They should not be in your module. They should be linked here. And I would suggest you consolidate and condense them a little bit. Because a lot of people have like 15 items in their introductory materials. Think about how you can roll them maybe into one page or one document, you know, a Word file or whatever, and link it. The reason we don't want 20 links up here is because it pushes the course summary clear down the page. 
the instructor contact information gets pushed clear down the page. So try to keep your number of links minimal here, but the typical introductory material should go here. I think maybe the only thing I could consider doing an exception is if you use one of the My Labs and you have your technical support information for those or you know uh, information about accessing them. Students might need that frequently and that might be okay to put that in the top section of your modules. But everything else that you can think of that is not course content should actually be in this, on the syllabus page. Now there's one thing I want to show you that I think is pretty important and I'll show you an example somewhere else. And this is kind of content organization also. If you link a page on the syllabus page, the students will go to page and they won't know how to get back to syllabus necessarily, especially we're assuming that when they go to the syllabus page, especially with these new students that have not had experience with Canvas, that they won't really know that they should just click syllabus to get back where they were because they're not necessarily sure where they were in the first place, right? So let me go back to the orientation course and show you an example of if you want to use a page and link it on your syllabus page, there is one important thing you should do. At the bottom of that page, you should provide a link that says back to syllabus area, because that will then let them click right back to where they came from and not be lost, okay? And let me see if I can find an example of that. Let me go to modules here. It won't be quite the same, but I do know that with the Kaltura stuff, I built a page and then I had linked to other pages in here for different reasons. And so like if I want to use adding this to Canvas, you can see here that it says, um, now my, uh, my recording stuff's always in my way, uh, back to main Kaltura page. And that helps them navigate to where they, need to go. This is not an issue in the modules. In the modules, they have the navigation tools of previous and next. And so you don't have to link all your pages. I'm referring only to things if you want to put a syllabus page together, or if you want to put a page link on your syllabus page or a syllabus area, that is the one that you would worry about linking. Here, this is kind of special uses. You know, you're, I'm trying to consolidate links and I have 45 pages somewhere. If you want to talk about that, now somebody might ask, how do you do that then? You're telling me to do it, so show me how. Okay, I'll go to pages, view all, whoops, view all pages. I'm going to create a new page. Uh, I'm gonna call it junk. Oh, I'm in the orientation course. I won't save this. <laughs> and then I'm typing stuff, here's my information. And then I say, I like to choose header three, and remember for accessibility reasons, you should just use these pull down menus to make your choices, header three, and I go return to syllabus, and I call it syllabus area, because we have the syllabus put in the syllabus area. I mean, I call it syllabus area just for clarity. Then you highlight it, and then you go over here to course, to the links tab, which is the default one that's open, go to course navigation and choose syllabus. And that will take you back, that will make that link a live link that will take you back to the syllabus area. Okay, and you can see it right here. Now I would save this, but I don't want to because I'm actually in the orientation course. So I'm going to cancel out of that. But let me tell you one more time again the steps. Create your page, do a couple hard returns or a hard return after the last information on the page. Type the words return to syllabus area. Use header three for return to syllabus area and then highlight the words. Go to the links on the right hand side, open course navigation menu and choose syllabus. And that will let you link it back to your syllabus area. And then if a student gets lost, they aren't lost. If you provide, that's an important part of content organization to provide clear navigation for your students and organize the materials so that they don't get lost. If they get lost, they get frustrated. If they get lost and frustrated early on in the course, they're more likely to drop a course. 
So uh, that's one of the things why, of course, uh, why it's very important to do a careful content organization. Sue, so what's the difference between save and save and publish? All right, the difference between save and save and publish is save is unpublished, so students can't see it. Save and publish means that it's available to students when it's in the modules. Okay. So if you were working on a page and you hadn't completed it, just right. save it. Kim uh, said, if you're working on a page, you haven't completed it, would you just save it? Yes, I would recommend that. A lot of faculty are using this as a, a content strategy too. If you're not done with, if you're not finished with something, leave it unpublished. That reminds you to go back to it and see why it's not published and then tweak whatever is wrong or not wrong, but unfinished with it. Maybe it's as simple as not having your date set. You know, maybe it's something like I need to write better instructions in an assignment. Maybe the discussion you had intended to embed a YouTube video and you hadn't had time to look for just the right one. If you leave those unpublished and you know that's your system, then you know that you can go back, finish your work, and then save and publish when you're totally done with it. And that's a good strategy for course building. All right. Uh, are there any other questions from uh, out in the web <laughs> streaming that I need to answer? Or Brandon, are there any points that people want me to discuss that I haven't talked about yet? I don't think so. Okay. All right, so let's go back here to, again to the examples in the viewing masterpieces. We, were, we kind of talked about the syllabus. If you go to the course menu, this will remind you again, we have these in multiple places, but this shows you that one of the things you need to do with your content management also is to check your course navigation links and make sure that they are, the correct ones are turned on, the grayed out ones students cannot see, now, once you make an announcement in your course, that will automatically turn that on. The absence of announcements means students don't need to see it, so then it's grayed out. The first time you put an announcement in your course, that will automatically activate itself. Um, these are examples of, of the things, and honestly, in the required elements, it gives you a list of the, the order that you should have your links and which ones should be on. And then, of course, there may be additional things like if you're doing a My Lab, or you, if you ask your students to use Kaltura to do video recordings, you would want to turn on your My Media because they can't get to their My Media if you don't enable that. If you don't ask your students to record anything in your courses, then you most likely don't need to turn that link on. Okay? Yes. Is Kaltura free to the students also? Kaltura, is Kaltura free to the students also? Yes, it's universally uh, available through, the, through Canvas for all courses, all instructors, all students. The behavior of Cal, Kaltura works the same no matter what your role is. So the My Media works for a student the same way it does for an instructor, okay? All right, so this is a little bit about that. And then the instructor evaluation, what do you think? I wanna talk just briefly about that. The instructor evaluation will be already populated into your provisioned or your term courses. If you go look now at your empty term course, you'll see one item in the module and it will be the instructor evaluation module, okay? And it will have the what do you think link in it and you need to leave that turned on and in your modules, but float it to the bottom at the end of the term because the students won't even have an evaluation link available to them until late in the term. So. Um, that information is right here. So please remember this is, once again, everything I'm saying today, except for that whole thing about the undelete that we had earlier at the very beginning of the session, all of this is in the orientation course. And so please uh, take advantage of that and go back into it. Uh, let's go back. Oh, I have a bad habit of not navigating using the navigation tools at the bottoms of the screens. Here are some examples of modules. And this is probably a, a, the crux of good content organization. So if, you, if you're really concerned about how to organize your content, Amy has done a great example here of giving you an overview. Also talks about here there is, she tells you where to go to get a refresher on how to use modules. It's right here. And here's your good module example and it explains why. 
It has descriptive titles. It has a consistent naming convention. The items within the modules will have a consistent naming convention and layout. They're organized so students can work chronologically. The activities are indented to help move them away from like the read-only content items. Okay, and they're brief and don't look overwhelming or cluttered. If you have, let's say that in a unit of instruction, you have 10 links to URLs that are just resources. You would not put those 10 URL resources in your modules. You would create a page in Canvas, call it, you know, unit resources or module or chapter one resources or whatever a relevant descriptive title. And then you would put those URL links in the page and put that page in your module. That way it keeps your module from getting super long and stringy, which yes, the students can collapse the modules, but it's just a little bit more of an efficient design strategy. Questions about that? Rob, you? Well, I was just thinking, you know, if you only had one URL. One URL is awesome. It could fit in. You don't want to make the students navigate unnecessarily. I know. So if there's one or two or three, your module still looks relatively short. I mean, look here, these are real, relatively tight, short modules. And you can see here that the PowerPoint link is in here. There's a page, there are the discussions, you can see where the activities are indented. So this is nice and tidy, but if you only have two or three items and you're not pushing this down to like- The whole page. The long scrolling roll of toilet paper. You don't want that in your course. That's a good content organization strategy. Somebody's laughing. <laughs> One thing with the uh, URLs is a key, the way the URLs work in Canvas that if it's not, if it doesn't think it's secure enough, it'll kick back an error. So that might be a reason for you to put it on a page instead. And then a second reason would be um, that on a page you can give context as why the student's going to that URL and what you want them to accomplish there. Yes, Brandon brought up two really good points there. If you put a URL on a page, it does eliminate some of that error message and that funky stuff that you sometimes get. And number two, you can put it in context. So in other words, a link to Google does a student no good. But maybe if you tell them what you, you know, or, or a link to a scientific website or a link to a business website. Doesn't do them a lot of good, you know, except if you explain it and put it in a page and say, this is a really good resource that you should be using throughout the term. Here's what I expect you to do with it. How to, you know, that is a really good content strategy also because just random URLs in the course isn't particularly helpful to students. And if you want a student to visit a certain URL for an assignment or for a discussion, where would that link be best placed? In the discussion. In the discussion, in the assignment. You wouldn't throw it loose out in your content modules and say, in this assignment, I want you to go to the website that's in the module and look up stuff and then come back here and do your assignment. Put relevant links in an assignment, you put everything in the assignment that the student needs to accomplish that assignment, okay? In a discussion, the same thing. You don't say, watch this YouTube, watch the YouTube video that's in this module and come back here and discuss. You put the YouTube video right in the module or right in the discussion, okay? That's how you keep your content organized, tight, and that's how you can accomplish these very nice looking tight modules. Uh, this chapter one summary would be where you would put, and again, we, re we recommend to all instructors that you put your objectives in each module. What do you want the students to learn from this module? And how will they accomplish it? You would give them the overview or a summary. And give, that's where you would give them your little mini lecture about here's what we're doing this week, or here's what we're doing in this unit. Here's why we're doing it, and here are the objectives. Here are the things that you should accomplish by the end of this module. Okay, these objectives should be met when you're finished. Um, and many times those objectives tie directly back to the objectives or goals that you have listed in your syllabus. So that's where you would go for the base of that. Where do you go to get your objectives? 
Well, number one, you uh, hopefully as an instructor know what you want to accomplish with that unit of instruction. But those objectives should also relate to something in your syllabus. You don't want to disconnect. You want your students to understand that the syllabus is relevant and that your course is addressing the stuff you put in your syllabus. Yes? So I, can I change the topic to PowerPoint? Excuse me? Do we now, can we just upload the PowerPoint in my files and link it to my files? The question was about PowerPoint. If they're plain Jane PowerPoint, uh, can you link those directly in your course and load it to your files? Yes, but I have a per personal preference. I'm not sure everybody shares this personal preference. I prefer the converted PowerPoints, no matter what kind of PowerPoint they are, simply because it displays them in a web-friendly view for the students. The ease of navigation is there. And yes, you can click the link to a PowerPoint in the module, and it shows you the preview, you know, but I still think navigation, it's, it frames everything, it sizes it for the window, and I just think a converted PowerPoint is more attractive and more user-friendly for the students. That's my personal platform. Officially, we're saying that if you have narrated PowerPoints, PowerPoints with speaker notes, or I think that's it, or media-rich PowerPoints, those should be converted. But if you have a plain Jane PowerPoint, that you just got like from your textbook publisher or somewhere like that and you haven't altered it or you've written your own PowerPoint and it's just a standard PowerPoint, you could upload that into your course files and link it on your modules. Now, there is a file size limit on your course files and I don't know what that is right off the top of my head, but if we go to files and you scroll down to the, in any course, scroll down to the bottom of the files, here it is, you have 524 megabytes allowed so in each course, I believe it is. Brandon, am I right? Is it each course? Do you know for sure? Yeah, in each course and those your personal files as well. Okay. So that means that you can keep, it, keep tabs on how full you're making your files with PowerPoints and that sort of thing. So keep an eye on that. That would be the only restriction or issue that I would see with your PowerPoints. Do you have to convert those or can we? All right, she asked about conversion. Go to the newsletter. The newsletter has all the conversion information in it and it tells you how to get your PowerPoints converted because it is different than what it was in Moodle. The instructional design team is no longer converting the PowerPoints. There's an automated process that goes through the IT department that gets you that done. And the latest and greatest information is in the newsletter in touch with my courses, and if you go to this just in, you will find information about converted PowerPoints. Um, we're trying to make that newsletter relevant and important so that people actually use it. We're trying not to throw fluff in there, but have relevant information. Um, let's go back now to- One other thing about the PowerPoints is if you do choose to upload them, I would preview them. A lot of instructors that I've talked to that tried them did not like them because they essentially make them look like a PDF where the students just scrolling through them and they're not viewing it one slide at a time. Okay. So pre for, for you guys who heard that preview, preview your PowerPoints when those links come back. Check your links. Don't just slap them in the course and go woohoo we're finished. I mean, and go into that student view in the end and spend some time just walking through your course as a student. Try out an assignment. You know, you don't even have to really submit anything. If you have asked the students to upload a file, upload a fake file. It doesn't matter what it is. That will allow you also then to go back in and try your grading because now we're all in course building now, but in a week, we're going to be kicking into instructor mode where we're going to be working with our students. We're going to be talking to our students through the inbox. We're going to be collaborating with them. We're going to be grading stuff. So what better way to test drive all that stuff than to be your fake student and try that stuff out? And I'll talk a little bit more about that in the finishing touch. <laughs> so, yes. Something I've done with PowerPoints is I like to print, I put four on a page. So I'll just print it to a PDF. So that way, if any of the students want to print it. All right. Um, Brandon, do you know what the new conversion process is? there still that resources link where the PDF file is attached in the original PowerPoint? Yeah, there is. 
So Kim mentioned that she likes to do the PDF file with four slides to a page, but the actual conversion process already gives them the, the PDF file and the original PowerPoint file. So not only are you giving them this web-ready, attractive PowerPoint that they can navigate through the table of contents, jump amongst the slides, you know, it also attaches the PowerPoint so that they can download it and see it that way if they prefer, or they can have the PDF file that they can print if they want printable notes. So, and it's also highly accessible. So for all those reasons, I still think, especially now that it's an automated process, I think it's very easy for all faculty to just continue to get their PowerPoints converted and use the linked PowerPoints from, I just think they're better. Um, that's my soapbox. All right, we looked at a good module. Let's look at a bad one. You can see here, week one, chapters one and two, then they jump to chapter three. It does, it's not consistent naming conventions. It's getting kind of long and stringy. Here is a bad file name. Somebody linked that but didn't edit the title. It should not say CH2 notes. It should say chapter two notes. It shouldn't say PDF. The students don't need to know whether it's a doc file or a PDF or whatever. The web browser handles all of that for them. So make it look clean and professional. Look at here. You know, and I've seen some people have links like this and they'll say 2016 in it. Well, okay, that PowerPoint might be just as relevant now as it was in 2016, but to the student, it looks old and dated. And they are going to judge it by the date, not by the relevance or the currency of the content. You know. The knee bone is still the knee bone, you know? So don't put, be careful with what you're doing here and take a look at how this works. And here are some pointers about what makes a bad one. And here's the makeover. Look how much better the after looks than the before, okay? And again, she also lists, Amy also listed in here how she transformed it, how she made it better. So again, go back to these, this orientation course and get the information out of here. It's really, I can talk for three days about content organization. Number one, you're gonna get really tired of hearing me yak. And number two, are you gonna remember everything? Here's your one-stop shop for that kind of thing, all right? Canvas 24 seven is great for, how do I put a link in my module? Shoot, I'm confused on the assignment. What should I choose? Should I choose online or should I choose no submission or what should I choose? Or how do I get these dates right? That's Canvas 24 seven. That clears us up to help you with actual design things. Because right now what's happening is we're having to tell a lot of people, yeah, great, we'd like to work on this project for you right now, but we're trying to get the semester started and we're kind of swamped. So we're, we're actually, being forced to set some instructional design projects to the side that we really would like to get started on and help people with because we're trying to help people with the basics that really we've got these resources in place. And I don't wanna discourage anybody from coming to us, but kind of do a little thinking first about what kind of help can I get from where, you know, and then still come to us if you're confused or lost. We do wanna help, but anyway, uh, let's go to the next button here and take a look. Here are examples of introductory activities. And again, um, here's how to use your inbox. Here's a sample of an introductory inbox assignment. We tried to, uh, Amy tried to put together actual examples of introductory activities that you could copy and paste. I mean, you, you probably have to relink this, but you know, uh, you could copy and paste these items and have it already made for you. Your How do you copy that? Hmm? How do you copy that from there? Oh, you just copy. Oops, paste. sorry. Well, this might be a screenshot. You have to go to edit. I well, yeah, but this you all won't have the edit button. I have the edit button. I don't. Now that I think about it, I don't quite know. I can you do control and you can't do that. Well, I can save the image. This is an image. So I could save the image and then look at it for reference or sit down, I mean, you know, for one thing is, is it's not terribly tricky to hammer this out. We're just trying to provide examples, not really reusable examples. Yeah, Patty. Should the introductory activities be a module? You said the introductory material should go in the syllabus part, but the activities should go as a module. 
Good question. She said, uh, the question was, should the activities be in the modules or on the syllabus area? They should be in the modules because they are actually course content activities. And so you might start your module with the introductory activities module. You might start your modules page with an introductory activities modules at the top. Those would definitely not go in the syllabus area. The read only materials tend to go in the syllabus area. Anything you ask your student to do should be in the modules. Okay, so, and here's a sample discussion activity, uh, getting started one. Read it, adapt it. I mean, these are supposed to be examples that you just read, then type up your own the way you want it because, and customize it. Here's a sample quiz activity, introduction, and here's a simple, like, how to do an assignment. Notice that no instructions on how to should be written by the instructor. You should either link to a Canvas guide or you should tell the students to click help over here to get help, right? So don't write your own instructions. Why? The software changes, your instructions aren't right. And believe me, those instructions seem to hang out forever and ever and people don't go back to them because you just don't think about it so link to things so that when changes happen your link is dynamic which means it will change with the change in the software or the content and do not create static links to documents you create yourself on how to do things number one we want you focusing on your content students have 24 7 help you know they can go there and get help they can chat they can call somebody they can email somebody 24 7. so if you have a student sitting out there that goes i don't know how to submit an assignment no we have not written a how to submit assignment document because canvas already has it and it will be current if they change how the assignment looks they will update their documentation so that's why you always want to link and you do not want to put static help resources in any of your courses, okay? All right. Um, do we know how to link? Do you know how to link? Uh, we will work it'll on in, that. It will be in that newsletter. But okay. How to link? Um, I will, there is a cheat sheet, but yes, there is information on how to link. Okay, we did it. Yeah. And if you don't know how to link, what would you do, folks? Help. 24-7 support. I want to link to help for doing discussions in my discussion. Canvas people, how do I do that? And you could give them a web link to the introductory discussion that you've created and say, I want to put a link in here for student help. And then it will show you. Okay, and it, let me just tell you, it's pretty simple. Oh, you, just, you just highlight it and link it to the external URL. This is actually a URL, because right? <coughs> Canvas documents or Canvas guides are URLs. When you click on me, does it allow, does it show you the Canvas guide as one of the things to go to, or how do you? Uh, she asked when you cl click a link, let me clarify first, Let's state that again, because I'm not quite sure what you're asking. Okay, so I'm in my page, and I'm doing this, yeah. telling them to, put, to go there. Do we, we type that in? Right. And highlight it. Right. And then click on link. Links. Course navigation. No. No? That's something different. No. If you want to create a URL link, right? Oh. You just have the URL here. Well, let me go somewhere where I can demonstrate. Let me so go. you'll go to the Canvas guide and go to where it is you want and copy the link or copy the link. And then you mm -hmm. highlight the link in the URL and then you link it as okay. a URL. Let okay. me go to go here so like um, I'm trying to show how to do a link to a canvas guide I don't have a canvas guide handy all right let me do let me do something else here I'm gonna open the help in a new tab and now again the zoom is in my way all right um, whoops that was weird okay I'll just click on help oh I know why I shouldn't have done it that way so I want to go to, I have a Canvas guide, right? But again, I don't, you just go to the guide, but again, I would suggest that you just go to a student 
guide. Oops. All right. Oh, no results. Oh, here we go. How do I how do I create a course discussion as a student? Let's just say that's the one you want to tell students to use. You would just take the URL and copy it. And then let me go back to this is somewhere where I can make a mess. Modules. And let's say I'm in a discussion. Let's see here. I'm, I've started, I'm writing a discussion, okay? I want the students to have the information about how to get help, right? So I edit this. And I can say, um, I highlight it, click the link to a URL. I'm, I'm doing control paste. I'm pasting the URL in there, inserting the link. And then I save and then they get that document. All right, that's how you would do it. So it's just a URL link using the rich content editor, okay? Okay, let's go back here. There are your assignments and your activities. Once again though, even, even there, I, I guess if I were teaching, I would probably, I, you could do it this way. You could also say, if you don't know how to, to get information on how to submit an assignment, click help in the global menu. Now don't say blue bar because we have a lot of people who have um, accessibility issues and they may not be using, they might be using high contrast or one of the other viewing modes and it will appear to be blue to them. So you would say click the help icon in the menu at the left. If they can't find that, they, they're, I mean, it's there. You don't really need the color blue. And I, my brain sees blue, and I always think that's an additional tip, but not everybody will see blue because they might be viewing the screen differently. Okay. Uh, we're right at 10 o'clock. Uh, I have one more hour. But here are examples of lesson introductions and overview pages. So how I talked to you a little bit earlier about putting your objectives in there and giving them an overview of the unit of instruction. Here are some really good examples on that. You can see this overview. It says the theme for the week is this. Here's information about it. Here are some reading instructions. And here are the assignments. So in here, the overview is stating the objectives in paragraph form, right? It's but you might have objectives that are a bulleted list or whatever. So that's one example, and this tells them what they need to do in the unit of instruction. Here's another example. This layout has pictures, and this is a um, H5P accordion. It's a screenshot, but it's cat you can collapse things. And if you want to know more about that, I'll refer back to the recording that Amy did yesterday for H5P, there's a whole section also in the orientation course about H5P, how to use it, how to do it. It's all in the orientation course. Because we, in the orientation course, we did put resources for third-party products. Because Canvas can't help you with H5P, right? The 24-7 Canvas support. They're helping with Canvas. If you send them an H5P question, they're going to be, huh? I mean, they might know what it is, but that's why we put the support there. So you can get colorful if you want and be creative. You also can uh, like embed a relevant video as an overview. It might even be you giving an introduction to the unit, speaking to your students, telling them with your voice and inflections what you think is important. You might do a mini lecture and build that into the course overview, and it's very easy to do and then also supply some resources. These are just examples of different ways you can lay out your course and uh, do some content organization things. And if you like that horizontal rule that appears in these pages, if you wanna add a horizontal rule, here are, is the information about how to add a horizontal rule. And this would apply in any page that you create that you could do this horizontal rule. Okay, questions? 
Okay, let's move on. Oh, we actually jumped right out of that module. And so I did cover basically all uh, the key things about the content organization. Here is your mini uh, resource for content organization. And this is really the guiding thing that I use today for discussing the content organization part of this presentation. Um, I will digress a little bit, but here is that, I just mentioned all those third party resources, here they are. A lot of people know how to record their Kaltura video, do the My Media because it behaves almost identically to the way it did in Moodle. But some people are like, well now how do I get it in Canvas? So that's why you would just go to Kaltura. And we've got all the resources, here's your, all the resources, the separate pieces and parts are separate links in those items. Uh, again, that's our content organizational thing. If we would have put 10 Kaltura links in here, look what this module would look like. So you do have to sit and think about strategy. A lot of people, I know you're all in the process of course building and probably most of you have got your courses pretty well built out, but if you ever start from scratch, a good idea is to kind of storyboard. Like, okay, what do I want in my overview? I want to stick a video, I want to put my objectives. You know, try to make yourself a little template so that when you're building your courses, or even revising your courses, you're consistent and clear, and it's an efficient way to do it. Um, here's your H5P information that was from yesterday. Uh, just a side note on publisher course websites, the instructional design team is not supporting publisher websites at all anymore. We can't, there's so many of them. They interact so differently with Canvas that we can't tell Kim. Yes, you need to put your assignments in there because when you sync, they have to be there. Or no, you shouldn't do that. We don't know. We also don't have access to those publisher websites as instructors. So we are out of our league with that. So we're asking people to go back to their publishers or their publisher reps to get assistance with the third party publisher resources. Okay. But anyhow, that's a little bit about that. Now, next, I am going to go into. Um, the finishing touches that I mentioned here in that document. Um, and again, it's, it's in the newsletter, it's right here. And we're, gonna, we're going to kind of go through this list um, and, and I'll talk to you a little bit about finishing touches. But uh, this in conjunction with your, um, in conjunction with your required elements, and then there's also, of course, cheat sheet, which I want to show you here. Just let me get a few things out of my way here. If I go back to the dashboard and I go to the orientation course and modules, course planning, requirements, objectives, and hybrid design. A lot of you are being thrown into the hybrid world for the first time and need some help with designing hybrid courses. There are tips in here with that also. But in this link is your required elements, which you should recognize this. And it gives you all the required elements. One advantage to not printing this is, if you don't know how to do something, like how do I add my profile picture? That's a live link. It'll take you right to the how-to for it. So that's another reason to use electronic documents. The web links are live, right? I mean, I know it's kind of a hard sell for people that like paper, but right there, like, I don't know how to do that. Well, yeah, you do. If you, if you, even if you have the paper copy, remember that if you don't know how to do something on that paper copy, go back to the original electronic one and click the links in it and it'll take you right to what you need to do. And then print that out. No, don't print. <laughs> Because if that changes or moves, you're out of luck. It's different. So try not to print, people. Save the trees. <sighs> okay, and then um, there is also, of course, a value evaluation checklist that's provided by Canvas, and it also gives you some tips, priorities. It's just another support document. It tells you what's, uh, I, the three stars is like a high rating, the one means essential, you gotta do it. And so this also, again, gives you all the links into the Canvas guides. I know I'm scrolling up and down the screen too much. Gives you the links to the guides and takes you right to where you need to go to get some help. Um, 
This last one is a cheat sheet for common Canvas tasks. And that is something that most of you have probably already been through. But so, when you asked earlier about how to link things, it, this is just the bare bones. And I actually had designed this originally for traditional folks that are only using their course for traditional purposes and not for hybrid or WB. So this is kind of the cheat sheet I designed for them, but it's kind of useful for everybody. Um, again, this is a little bit different because now you can go to the hub and, and get to your courses or whatever. It's still the same. It will still work. But this just walks you through the bare bones. How to add your files and link them on the syllabus page. How to add text to, uh, to your syllabus page. How to edit the home page. How your settings should look for your home page. And how to build out your gradebook. So it's kind of bare bones. Um, but it should give you some tips. Um, that's your cheat sheet. There's where you go for your required elements. So now let's go back to my document here. Are the course navigation menu items set in the required order? We already talked about that. But now not everybody will know how to do that, but I will show you how to make sure that your navigation items are properly set. And let's go somewhere to this jump so that I don't ruin good things. Let's go to this course. You can see I have all sorts of things turned on here, right? So what you need to do is go back to that navigation, that handout, which, okay, I have a paper copy, sorry. <laughs> it should be in the order of home, announcements, syllabus, modules, grades, people, my media, if you use it in your courses, and you do it. How do I do that? I go to the course homepage, I go to settings, I go to navigation, and then I fix what I need. If I'm not going to allow my students, or if I don't need to allow my students to upload from Google Drive or from Office 365, uh, or you, then you just take that link out if it's irrelevant. However, there might be students who do use Google Drive quite a bit, and then you'd want to provide them this avenue to quickly upload things into their course the courses. So let's just say that we are not going to use Google Drive. I just click on it and disable it. It slides it down to the list at the bottom. Oh, this isn't a Cengage course. I disable it. It moves it down here. I'm not going to do StudyMate. And for one thing, I go, if you're using StudyMate, read the documentation in the instructor orientation course about StudyMate. I usually turn that link on while I'm building out my StudyMate and getting them ready. And then I hide that link or I just undo it here because the students, you don't really need them to go to the StudyMate link to go to it. You want them to work out of your modules, kind of like you do with pages or something like that. But, but for an instructor, you have to turn it on kind of so that you can use it and make use of it but then turn it off when you're finished with development. How do I rearrange things? Uh, I just drag and drop, right? What is the you do it again? You do it is the question. Question is, what is the you do it? That is the accessibility checker that you should run on your course before you, and I'll get to that in a little bit. The you do it link does not show for students. So one thing is, is after you finish this one important step, You've got to save or it didn't do anything. And it's really easy on this page to forget to save. And then you look at your course menu and you go, I just fixed it. Why isn't it right? It's because the save button's hiding clear at the bottom of the screen, at the bottom of that roll of toilet paper, right? Now, how do we make sure that this menu looks the way it's supposed to? You go to student view. Now you see what the student sees, okay? So make sure that it's it's uh, home. There are no, the announcements is in the wrong order here. It should be home announcements, syllabus, modules, grades, people, my media. You do it. So this is not in the right order, but I just showed you all how to do it. So I'm not going to spend more time with that. But that is how you edit your course menu, your navigation menu. This is the global navigation menu for lingo purposes. This is the course navigation menu. 
We're going to leave student view. Now, the next thing you do is, is the home page set as the home page, as the front page? So like right here, home. Okay, that is right. If you hit your home button, you need to make sure, especially after you copy your Canvas course into your term course, I'm finding that most of the time the home page, or a lot of the times the home page doesn't hold. It just comes unhooked. It didn't go away. Okay, so let me show you this. I'm going to make this wrong because most likely it will default to course modules. All right. So now when I hit home, where am I? Modules. modules. If I go to um, the syllabus, okay, that looks right. I hit home, I'm in the wrong spot. How do I fix that? All you have to do is choose home page, and then it should say pages, front page, which is your home page, and choose it and save. And now if you go out like to syllabus and come back, you're at home. You wanna be super sure you've got it right, do your student view again, okay? Now, if for some reason when you try to choose your home page that that pages, front page isn't there, so that means somehow you've maybe fiddled around in your course files and deleted it. <laughs> or, or, or not in your course files, in your pages. You've accidentally deleted it. That would be a good time to con contact the instructional design at southeast.edu and say, I don't seem to have my banner page anymore. Can you help? And we can reapply it. But please, please, please make sure that when you get your courses over there and their provision, that you use your student view and that you check to make sure that the banner page is your home page. We're trying to make at least the basics for students to be similar in all courses. Okay. Um, when you look at this page, is your course, is this set, is, and the next question is, is the course number and the instructor information completed? So this shouldn't just say course number here and instructor with nothing. That's the default of the template. Make sure you've got that information in there. Make sure your banner is there and it's the correct banner for your discipline, okay? Because we do have a few that actually had incorrect banners. Um, we don't know how or why it happened, but we can fix it. So make sure it's the correct banner. And then also make sure that this material down here, the welcome message with the link to the syllabus, the link to the modules, and the all important Canvas student orientation is there. Brandon built that course out and it is awesome. And it walks students through how to do everything. Again, this is also why, if that's another thing you could put in your instructions. Don't know how to do a discussion? Go back to the home page. Click Canvas Student Orientation because it will tell them there step by step how to do everything. So let's get those students using this important resource. That's as important to the students as the instructor orientation is to the instructors. Probably even more important than going to 24 seven help and the help button in some respects because it's all built out. All they have to do is get to the modules page and read. And so that has really robust Cool stuff in it. Let's just go to it. The students self enroll. So the first time they're here, they'll have enroll, and you say, Yes, I've enrolled already. And here is the orientation course. It explains to them what it's about and it walks them right through it. Okay, so you can go to the modules, just like you do for the instructors, and look here. It tells them how to be successful as an online learner, tells them all the different ways to get help. It also shows them how to navigate, how to set their profiles. You know, you can, it's right here in one spot. And it's, it's customized for SEC students, which is very important also. And again, things that are linked in here are dynamically linked, not statically linked, so that when things change, this will change here. How to, how to uh, communicate, how to use your inbox how to track and submit assignments, 
how to take quizzes, how to check your grades, how to use the mobile app. Here's information for them on how to use Kaltura. It's customized for students. And there is a downloadable PDF in there with all the individual steps that's customized for SEC. There's information about smart thinking. So you can see here how easy it is. Here's how to, you know, how it is for them to go to one spot and get all their help. So I guess personally, now that, I mean, I, I, I kind of don't always think about it, but you know, if you want to refer your students to help, you know, tell them to go to the orientation first or use the help button. Because look how this is built out for them. Once we get them here, they're going to be self-guided learners that will know where to go to get help that makes sense to them. They don't necessarily have to chat. If they're still stumped, then they can use the help button and get help. But it's all right here, you know. So that might be, that, that to me is a very awesome resource that, like I say, Brandon built that out and it's really good. So please Yes. One of the questions in the chat was if uh, instructors can enroll and take that course. Yes. Can instructors enroll and take the course? Yes. I did. I'm, I'm there. I'm there as an instructor, not as a designer. So yes, anybody can enroll in that course. Instructors should probably go through it and take a look at it because that gives you that frame of reference too. And it's that mental cue then that if you've seen it and you believe in it, and you've bought into it, you're gonna to remember to tell your students to use it, okay? Isn't there a link in the, on the hub in the left-hand corner? Good point. Kim brought up uh, a point. She said, is there a link in the hub? Isn't there? And there is. If the students go to the hub and click on my courses, and click on my courses, I didn't click the link, there is a link right here. For the orientation okay so they can do it now they can do it now yes they can get into that orientation now they can get into that we intend to leave that link i'm pretty sure the syllabus statements thing is for us i don't think students see that but they yep. also go ahead students are enrolling in it now already i've i think there's 500 people in there enrolled already so it's useful Students wouldn't be using it and enrolling in it if they didn't think they needed help with Canvas. So give them that help. That's the best resource we've got out there for them. And also, before the term starts, students sometimes freak out and say, well, my courses aren't there. My courses aren't there. My courses aren't there. Well, there's also a link here so they can check their class schedule because the courses won't appear until the first day of classes unless you publish them deliberately ahead of time. So that will let them at least check their registration and make sure that they are enrolled and that they just have to wait. That gives them that security blanket because we get a lot of that at the beginning of the term. Okay, I've got a million bazillion things open here. Let me see where I should be. Um, <laughs> all right, where did I leave off? Okay, the next point in the finishing touches on this part of the agenda, the syllabus area. Check your syllabus area. Let me go to the dashboard and let me go to my course. Go to the syllabus area. Is your syllabus linked? You know, and again, student view to make sure that it is right, that it is working as it should. You know, have you missed putting any of this information in? Make sure that your housekeeping materials, I've said this a lot of times, because this content organization and finishing touches kind of intermingles and overlaps. Make sure your housekeeping details, the read-only documents, the introductory materials are linked here rather than in your modules. Make sure that the instructor introduction is very brief or that you have linked it. A lot of people like to put a personal bio in there with some pictures and some professional information about me. Here's my history as a professional. If it gets to be a little bit longer and more than a line or two, remember, we don't want that long scrolling roll of toilet paper. If it's, then create a page in Word. Just type it up in Word, how you want to introduce yourself. Load it into your My Files and then link it here 
so that the students can just hit the preview button, just like they can with your syllabus and your CID, and read your introduction. Okay, then you can get fancy. You don't have to worry about length because you're linking it. You're not pushing that page down with two paragraphs about, about your instructor. It can be an introduction and a welcome. You might want to change the words, instructor introduction and welcome, so that you're welcoming message to your students. In this course, here's what we're going to study. This is why I think this course is important to all of you as students at Southeast Community College. So it wouldn't necessarily just be an introduction. It could also be your welcome tied into that. And that could be one link rather than three or four or five or six links or every little piece of thing you want to share with your students. OK. Um, is, and also double check that you haven't accidentally killed out this link down here to take them to the modules. Because remember, we're, we're directing them in a path. Home page, then you go to the syllabus page, or you do the orientation course, right? If you don't know anything about, but it's home page, syllabus, modules. And so make sure you keep that path intact and don't delete that by accident when you're editing this page, because that came in on your template. So just take a peek at the bottom and see if it's still there. If it's there, it's fine. If it's gone, instructional design, contact one of us and we'll help you get that statement back in there. But honestly, you can do it yourself. If it's in one of your courses and not in the other, read it. How do you add this link to modules? Do you remember? You edit, right? You scroll down, you highlight the word modules, and then you go to modules and take them to the top of the page. I mean, this link is generic, but it is one way you could fix it yourself. So, and if it doesn't do what you want it to do when you've tried it, contact us and we'll help you get it fixed, All right? Next, and we have kind of gone through some of these things already on modules, um, the Two. finishing touches, yes. One other thing they can check on that syllabus page is the course summary. Thank it's you. It's the easiest way to check due dates and if they miss something. Perfect. Brandon makes a perfect point. In Canvas, you have to set your due dates manually on each individual item. When you're all finished, how do you make sure it's okay? You click the syllabus link, look at this course summary, make sure that everything is in here the way it should be, that you don't have any wonky dates, or that you don't have anything that is missing a date. Because if you do not put dates in here, Let's just say none of these had a date on them. They would be listed alphabetically. They will not list chron chronologically, like you're, you might have them in a different order in your modules. If you don't put dates in your activities, quizzes, assignments, discussions, if you do not apply dates, it will list them here alphabetically, which oftentimes is not the way you want your students to see things. Use your dates. Please use your dates. And also, when you use your dates, remember Canvas has this awesome new function that makes it even more important to use dates because now that you've got your courses built, once you have all your dates applied, if you teach at next semester or two semesters away, if your master's set up right, you can roll all those dates forward and you don't have to touch one date, right? And you don't want to do that. Why do that work if you don't want to do it, right? You can also do a date shift to move things around a little bit if Martin Luther King Day, Thanksgiving, you know, different holidays, Labor Day, Memorial Day, those holidays intervene and the college is closed. It's easy to shift, but it's a giant pain in the rear to start from scratch here. And students get notifications all over the place. If they have their notifications properly set, they can get them in a text message, they can get them in an email to whatever account they've chosen. They go to the home page, there's a to-do list there. It tells them what's pending and maybe what's late that they haven't done. All that stuff is right there for them. They also show up on the calendar. So the dates are super, super, super important. Yes? A student asked me if they could see all three classes at one time. A student asked if they could see all three classes at one time. Yes, on the calendar. 
on the calendar. That is why color coding is important for you on the dashboard. And that's personal, that's individual user. Let me go back and show you. I think I covered all the stuff about dates. If you have dates here, they'll put the dates in first, and then if you have any that don't have dates, they drop at the bottom of the list in an alphabetical order. So here's your perfect place. Brandon brought up a great point here. This is the perfect place to go to check yourself because there really is nowhere else to check. Let's talk for a moment about the calendar, which is a good point. If you go to the dashboard, you can see that this is charcoal gray, red, green, blue, and the same color. If I leave these two the same color, then on my personal calendar, not the students, the students set this themselves, on my personal calendar, I won't be able to tell between the due dates here and the due dates here, because all those links will be that color. So that's why it's important to go here and fix your color. I would maybe want this to be a uh, purple, do I not have purple? Purple, and apply. Now when I go to my calendar and I have dates, and I really don't know what's on my calendar, I have not looked lately, so not much, huh? Uh, oh, wait a minute, do I have them all turned on? No, let me turn it. Here's another thing, you can decide how to show your, I, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm kind of out of my league on calendar, I haven't played with a lot lately, but you have to turn on your calendar, like to, you can choose what to display. So a student can decide what courses they want to watch and what courses they don't want to watch, here they can show them all or they can show just one or and i'm sorry i apologize but i don't really have dates in here i'd have to go into the student view probably i could see it but that's where all your well, right here you can see and i think those have lines to them brandon and would i be right that those things are expired and the students can't do them anymore so there's a line through them i think they're just past yep past due dates they also see here how they messed up <laughs> but you can see where now the color is important. And again, send them to that student orientation. They'll learn how to get their calendar set up to display it in a way that's useful to them. And they can change their own colors. Yes. Uh, yes, they can change their colors wherever they want. The color coding is by user. So you do not control their color coding on the dashboard or in their calendar. And you can, the students can change that color coding, or anybody can. If you get right here, whoops, how do you do that yet? Right here, maybe. You can change your color right from here. You don't have to go back to your dashboard to change the color. So if you get over here and you go, wow, I've got three greens over here, you can quickly change them here. Okay. Um, let me see where I was. Okay, on modules. Um, are your titles brief, meaningful, and consistent in format? We've talked about that. One other thing we haven't mentioned, and I know some people don't want to stop doing this, don't put dates in your module titles. Because when you roll your course forward, that's just something that you have to edit. I think it's probably better to just give the module a meaningful title. All the due dates show everywhere for students. If they click the syllabus page, they have the running laundry list, right? They have the to-do list, they have their calendars, they have their notifications that get sent to them. So I don't think it's very important to put the dates there. If you're strongly attached to them, just realize then you're gonna have to edit. But if you have to do dates because it just kills you not to use dates, only use it in the module title. Do not put dates in your instructions, do not put dates in your pages, because those get buried, and then when you roll the course forward, the old dates are sitting there, and it makes no sense to do that. Let the software control your dates. And it's, I know people say, you know, but students forget to do stuff. I have to put dates everywhere because they won't remember. I'm going to guarantee you that those students that won't benefit by additional dates nearly as much as you think they will and you're making a lot of work for yourself we'd rather have you invest your energies in how could i make this assignment better how could i get a hold of an instructional design team you know this course this module is a little 
lackluster. I've got a bunch of lecture notes. Is there a way to present them in a prettier format? Now that sounds silly because pretty doesn't necessarily matter because the content's what matters. But pretty kind of matters to a lot of students. And it matters to you guys too. You just don't realize it. How uh, inclined are you to read a page of text that's solid body copy? It's hard to read. It's not, you have to be very committed to want to read it, you know, and you have to realize there are a lot of students that aren't all that committed to your course content. And if it, if you put that roadblock, okay, I'm an English teacher, I used to be an English teacher. Bad grammar, punctuation, and spelling are roadblocks, roadblocks to the content, right? You frustrate people, they leave. Even if your content's awesome, they don't, they don't want to jump through all those hoops and go through all those barriers. So if you can make it more appealing for students, you make sure your content's really solid. We want you to spend time then coming to us and say, how do we make it more visually appealing? Because I, okay, for example, this newsletter is something you can put in your courses. We would have to design it for you, but if you have a lot of body copy, we could, oh, I, I wish I could, let me think about this. Let, let me just go into my email because I've got a great example that Amy did that will be more relevant to you, just a second. Preceptor links. Oops, that's not right. It would be these. All right, Amy was tasked with somebody in the health division they have these preceptors out somewhere. I don't even understand exactly what it is, but they just needed a lot of information, heavy text-based, right? Again, pages and pages of content, but here's what it looks like when, after she put it in the RISE presentation. And look how much more appealing this is. And it also lets the user keep track of where they left off so that when they come back, they can see what they went through and what they did not complete. So this is just plain body content. Here's a flashcard to give them a definition. All this was, was 10 or 15 or 20 pages of text typed up in Word. And can you see how it, it kind of does have a way cool visual appeal to it? You can use the tabs. It's just presenting things in just a more eye appealing nature. You do the recap. To me, it just flows nicely. And here's a checklist. You can check this and go, okay, now I've finished this unit. Do you see that? After I'm done reading it. Then if I go to scenario, it takes me into another unit of instruction. And it explains information. And it just has some pretty, pretty images in it. It just makes it read more like a magazine rather than, you know, a text file. And also, in a real course, you can insert quizzes and knowledge checks and those sorts of things, and those will feed to the gradebook. So I know I'm digressing here a little bit about for away from finishing touches, but I'm telling you that the more efficient you are with your course content building, and the more efficient you are with getting your finishing touches in so that the course is, flows nicely and runs well for your students some more time and the more efficient you are with your own time management with dealing with Canvas courses, the more time you're gonna have to sit and ponder and say, you know, I got this and it's this way and it's okay that way, but maybe instructional design team members could do a little more with it to make it more visually appealing or like to insert a knowledge check into this in the middle of this so that you know they went there and they did it. You know, so I think those things are where we kind of would like to go in the future. After we get over this initial hump of getting us all into Canvas, and when it levels out and everybody's kind of where we are, with some of the cool Canvas tools like rolling dates forward and stuff, if you're careful with your course design, I think you're going to have more time to explore those other things and give us work that's really meaningful and helpful for the students, more interactive, more engaging, you know. And yes, can they learn? Yeah, remember way back, and well, Rob will remember, he was here. When we started with our online education in 1998, it was text-based. And we thought we were awesome. Black and white. It was black and white text, and that was it, you know. 
And we thought we were tackling the world because we were offering online courses to students who couldn't come to campus and take them. Times have changed. Look how easy it is to add video now compared to, well, we couldn't add video. It wasn't an option. So as things move forward, try to be more proactive with your courses and help us help you be more innovative with stuff because there are things out there that you might not know. I mean, I didn't even know until Amy started talking to me more seriously about RISE, how robust it was and what you could do with it. You know, so, I mean, it's all something to learn. Okay, and we'll try to do workshops that, okay, I'm off my soapbox now. Be efficient. And in your modules, we've already talked about most of these, but I'll just review them again for sake of, um, and I should go to this document, for sake of argument. Are the titles brief, meaningful, no dates? Is content arranged logically and chronologically? Not only are the modules chronological, but have you got the content within your modules arranged chronologically? The things you want them to do first are first in the module, so that's important. Okay, is module content broken into short, topic-specific chunks? You wouldn't want to do unit one, unit two, and unit three for a whole semester because they're going to be this long. So break it down into small chunks that are manageable for students and aren't scary to them when they open it. You know, you open a module and you see 500 things, you're going to be like, oh, Lord, I'm done. Going to sign up for somebody else's class. Okay. Um, does each module clearly tie objectives stated to the course syllabus? Um, are due dates correctly set on all activities? And I have not talked about that, but I do want to go back to this because it's pretty important. If your due dates, <coughs> let me, if your due dates are wrong, let me just go into this one and let's edit it. And I want to talk about your due date. Oops, that's not the right way to do it. I knew that. <laughs> I thought I clicked it. This is a discussion forum, but what I'm discussing with you would apply to any activity. When you set your due dates, there is a due date, an available from, and an until. Okay? Right now, as I look at this particular due date, available from is not set, which means it's available during the whole term of the course. It doesn't open on a certain date. It's there from the square one which is okay. If you want all your discussions available to your students at this, for the whole term at the beginning, open. Like maybe they're gonna to jump to week 10 or 11 or 12 and participate in a discussion and you're okay with that, then available from does not need to be set. If you want to control the pace of the course and try to keep, and I prefer this for myself when I teach, I wanna to try to keep them in a module at a time and moving through in a kind of a group and I don't want outliers working ahead, although I don't know many students that work too far ahead. But if you want that, put your available from date so that like this module starts at this date. You can make a decision about when your modules are kind of available or the activities are available to students. Um, the due date here, setting this, this is a discussion. It would be the same way in a quiz or an assignment if you set only the due date the student will have access to that activity for the entire term, not just till the module's done and you're moving forward. The due date is a suggestion about when the student should have it finished, okay? If you do not set the until date, that's open then for the entire term, okay? That's why the until date is important. You have two choices on your until date. If you do not accept late work, you set your until date to match your due date. I, if your syllabus says, I do not accept late work, then you set a due date and an until date. Set them both, same date, same time. If you accept late work and you have a late work policy, you can enforce it with the until date. Let's say this is due on September 3rd, but I give them a week. I have a, I, I accept late work for one week, okay? Then your until date would be September 10th at 11.59 p.m. Okay, that would give them a week to do it. You also can invoke a late policy 
on students that penalizes them by certain percentages by days late. So by day seven, they, they, well, you couldn't have them down to zero, but by day eight, you'd have them down to zero. So you could invoke that late policy, and I believe that's in the grade book. Brandon, could you remind me about where the late policy shows up? Yeah, it's in the grades area under the wheel on the top right. It's in grades or in assignments? It's in grades, right? Grades, yeah. All right. So uh, here's your gear. I know I set a late policy once. So that your light policies and your other conditions, uh, like automatically grading miss, missing submissions, you know, in Moodle you had to add the earned zeros on quizzes. You can actually set your policies right here. And here's your light auto, uh, automatically apply a deduction. And then you can put that in here and show the lowest percent. So your light policies are in the grades in the gear area. And then there's also grade posting policy automatically. But I wouldn't change this. I would just like grades post, but here's your light policies. Brandon, do you have anything to add about that aspect? Uh, just note that if you, you have to change the Intel date, like if you're adjusting for a holiday or something, like you have to go in and do Oh. On the calendar, you can just adjust the due date, but you have to go into the assignment to adjust the Intel date. Right, okay. On your calendar, let me go to see if I can find a calendar that has some items on it. On your calendar, you can drag and drop items. So help me out here, okay. So if I want this moved to a different date, I can drag it and drop it, right? Because it's a holiday. This is what Brandon was explaining. However, if I have the until date set, it drags the due date, but it does not change the until date. So use drag and drop on your calendar carefully and make sure that if you are using that until date, that you actually go into that item and change the until date. Because it, well, depending on which way you drag it, that until date could be really goof things up, right? So make sure that you remember but if you're dragging and dropping dates on your calendar that you check your until dates on those items that you drop. Personally, I wouldn't probably use this. I'd probably just go into the assignment, edit it, change it there, and then I know everything's set correctly. Okay, so I hope everybody understands that importance of that until date and the function of it, because I think a lot of people are gonna be especially tripped up on quizzes. They're gonna set a due date on a quiz and think the students can't do that quiz after that due date is passed. That is not true. The until date shuts off student access. The due date does not shut off student access. Okay? All righty. Um, another thing to check in your modules, let me go back, is whether all the PowerPoints are set up correctly so that they have the HTTPS. All your PowerPoints should look like this. If you have moved PowerPoints across from Moodle, or if you've added PowerPoints, they should load in the same window, okay? If they do not, and if you get an, a funny message, or if it doesn't look like that, go into the PowerPoint and edit. And this is primarily with those you brought across from Moodle. Add that S, H-T-T-P-S, okay? Maybe shows a little better on this document right here. HTTPS. It makes it way more user friendly for the students. Okay, let me cancel that. That's that for all URLs, not yeah, just PowerPoints. Just, yeah, check all your URLs. I've only run into one or two that adding the S doesn't fix it. And I've also run into one other thing that isn't on this cheat sheet. I've had some people that have had trouble with, they have linked, they have, uh, put YouTube links in their courses, just in, in Moodle it was just a link to a, U, to a YouTube yeah. video. <coughs> I've had trouble with those opening for people. And it's because in Moodle we always told you to grab the share URL for the YouTube videos instead of the web address at the top, okay? 
So let me go to YouTube and show. Oops. All right. So let's say we want this. All right. In Moodle, we always told everybody to get, oh, where is the share link down here? This little link here, right? It's a short link. And we told them to use that in Moodle because that's what Moodle liked best. Well, guess what? In Canvas, it prefers the longer one. And this one seems like it's kind of a match. But, but some of those links aren't working right in YouTube for people. They're not displaying properly. So the solution to that would be to go to, click the link because you can always click it. Oh, I'm scared if I can, okay. Let's just say this gave me a funny message here and it didn't really work. I can also click here, right? So if you're seeing something funky on your main screen, like an unhappy face or something weird, like this isn't a secure browser or whatever it says, you can always click up here, right? But look how inconvenient that is for the students. The students aren't gonna look at your PowerPoint or your YouTube or anything else if it's not right there in their faces. They're not gonna understand that they can also click this and open it in a new window, right? But with YouTube then, you would have that in a new window, you'd be back to that YouTube video, and then you would know to grab this URL up here and replace, oh, well, I wanna go over to YouTube again. You wanna grab this URL, edit your link in your modules, and replace it with this one and it's more likely to work. That's been what's worked for me. Brandon, have you had any experience? Am I correct in what I'm telling people? Yeah, that's what I've seen as well. Okay, all right. I just want to make sure that it wasn't just a Sue Fielder thing, but that that really worked, okay. Um, are all your modules and course content published? Are green check marks everywhere where they need to be? So like here, they are, well, wait a minute, I'm in the orientation course now. I've got too many things rolling. So if I go to modules here, I, I can see I've got problems. If I really want these two modules to show they're not turned on, right? You have to make sure that you don't randomly have some things unchecked here. Those will not show for students. They're unpublished. Again, what's the best way? to figure out whether you've got it right or not, student view. Go to home, hit student view, review your course that way, okay? And that's what the next point was. Have you validated your links? I ran into that uh, with somebody yesterday, which the course looked great, right? But the, that link validator, which I'm going to settings, all right? Go to home page, go to settings, and then choose validate links and content. This will check for all your broken links, all right? You run the validator, and here it found one broken link in this item here. And I can show you that if you go here and click on the discussion. Can you see this teeny tiny link here? Well, it goes nowhere. And it's because in this document, the instructor thought they had the link gone, but there's just a little character in there yet that was still hiding out in La La Land. And so we have to edit that. And where was that link? Here, right here, right? You can't even see it. Uh, or we could, if we don't know how to do it and there aren't any other links, you can just also do this, remove link. Right? Or, and, but if there are other important links in there that you don't want to get rid of, then you could, if you know it's sitting right here, you could highlight these words and back through that sentence and remove link. Brandon, can you think of any other faster ways to do it? it, it you have to do this manually, correct? Yeah, that's the only way. Otherwise, you have to go to the HTML. Right, and most people don't like to do that. So it's gone, and if you're stumped about how to do it, let us know. But now if I go to settings, and I validate links and content, I mean, it takes you right to where they are, and I restart the link validation. This will take a few minutes to run, and it will, now it should give me a clean bill of health, and I shouldn't have any broken links, okay? Um, and I know it will run, so. Uh, let's go back. 
I'll let that run because we're running out of time and I don't, I do want to finish right on time. Oh, I've got 10 minutes. That clock up there is fast. Okay. Gradebook. Does your gradebook setup match your CID? Okay. If you use weighted grade cop categories, are your groups set to show that weighting? And do all your activities have the correct point values? Those are three key things to check in your gradebook. And now let's see if that validator finished. See here, the validator ran, no broken links. Run your validator till you have all your problems solved. Do all of this in your master course. And I know I've said, I haven't said that today. Do this all in your master course. Don't import into your term course and start tweaking things. We're running into a lot of people that are doing like a unit and saying, okay, I'll put that over in my provision course. And then they're doing this copy over and over and over and they're getting things goofed up. Make sure everything is as perfect as you can get it in your master course. And then the last step is to import. Remember, we don't have classes starting till August 26th. So you've got until maybe the Friday before or the Thursday before maybe to import and address issues that might surface. Don't get in a hurry to import into your term courses because then you've replicated a problem across the world or across at least across the course. Okay, let's go into assignments here, and I'll show you a little bit about the gradebook and, and reiterate some of the things I just mentioned off the list. First of all, these are groups. Make sure that you have all your groups correctly built. If you imported from Moodle, it will say imported assignments. You want to change that to something that matches your CID. If your CID says there are 400 points in this course, the end, then just call it homework or graded work or whatever you want to call it, but give it a name that means something to the students. Imported assignments means nothing to them, okay? You also, if you import from Canvas, you might have some groups in there. I think they might just say assignments and they'll be empty. Make sure you have no empty groups in here, okay? Delete empty groups or if they're empty, they should be empty for a reason. I'll show you an example. In this course that I borrowed from Erin, She's using a MyLab, a mastering lab. And there, when she syncs with that lab, it will feed the assignments, the actual assignments, into this category. So that's why it's empty. It's by design, not by accident. And if you use weighted grades in your cor course, those should be showing up at the end of every group. Okay. Now, how do you get that turned on? You go up here to the three dots. This will be unchecked the first time, right? And you check mark it, and then this window pops up where you can set your weight. And this is a great checkpoint to make sure you end up at an even 100%. I've seen a lot of grade books that don't land on 100. So this is one way to check it. If you use a totally points based grade book, you don't use any weighting at all, then you would set up these groups, but you wouldn't apply any weighting. This would be just a short sorting so the students can kind of see, oh, here are my discussions, here are my assignments, here are my quizzes. And it also will tell them in their grades at the end, there'll be the list of those categories and it will tell them, or no, it's at the bottom of their list. It's at the end of the instructor list at the bottom. It will show them how they're doing for their grades in discussion, how they're just, you know, and it'll give them a kind of an overview. Um, and that's another thing I would try to test drive as a student, you know, be your test student, do some activities, put some grades in, as, then go out and then as an instructor put some grades in. And then go to grades and see what it looks like for students because the instructors looks like a spreadsheet, right, when you go to grades. The students does not, it goes down the screen. And let's see, I don't know if there are any, let me see if I can show you quickly. And I know I'm digressing a little bit here but it is relevant because we're talking about grades. Here's how the student sees it. They see how, if you have weighting, it will explain it. If you don't have weighting, it will just list the categories, okay? And it says, they can also do this what if. You know, have you ever had at the end of a semester or a quarter, like, if I get a really good grade on the final exam, will my 20% all of a sudden be an A? Well, you can send them over here and say, do your what if, and it's right here. You know, so, but here at the end, it also gives them a summary of how they're doing. So that view for students is totally different than what it is for the faculty, for grades. 
but you can see it's really well laid out. If they can't figure out what they're doing there, I think it's way more intuitive for students than what the Moodle gradebook was. All right, let's go back to um, the assignments. And let me make one other really important point about assignments. I've got five minutes. Um, if you have items in a category, these activities, the points matter. In Moodle, you could force it like you could have a 100 point assignment, a three point assignment, a 25, they could be all over. And if you kept them in that category and set it up just right with Moodle, it would override that. It would treat them all equally. You can't do that in Canvas. So in a group, the points matter. If you put a 100 point item in a group along with a 10 point item, the 100 point item is gonna be worth a whole lot more to the student's grade than the 10 point item. My recommendation is build your groups in a way that you can keep similarly weighted things together. Like if your exam, if exams, don't give a five point exam. If your quizzes are worth not nearly as much, like maybe you've got five or 10 or 15 10 point quizzes, put them in a quizzes category and then call it quizzes and they're all 10 pointers. Then make an exams category with the big numbers, the 100 pointers and put them in that category. It will just be more understandable to the students about where the big guns are. You know, if you mix them all together, the students are going to say, well, it's in this category, they're all kind of counting the same, and they aren't. So be cognizant of that, and that might be a reason why you might, if you have something that's called quizzes and exams, and your weights are really wonky like that, you might want to change your CID and say quizzes, exams and make two different categories so it syncs up with your grade book. Now that won't necessarily change how you grade things, it's just how it's displayed to student and it makes it more meaningful and understandable to them. Because the more you can keep your point values in a similar range or kind of in the same, the, the better that group will be for students for understanding why. Because if you have a 100 point assignment in there and a 10 point assignment in there and they, got, they scored all 10 points on one and they got two per, 2% on the 100 point assignment, they're gonna go, well, I had a hundred, you know, what's going on here? And they think, they thought they would at least average out to 50 and it won't, you know, okay. Enough said about that. Um, let me see what else there's about the grade book. Um, make sure your weights are correctly set. Um, <clears throat> there's some other tips in here and you can go into this. Announcements. Have you set up your, have you got announcements? Because in Canvas you can create announcements and you can set them up ahead of time and you can configure them by date to release them at certain times. So like if you do a weekly update <coughs> that says, welcome to week two. This week we're gonna be doing this or that or the other. Make sure you remember to do this. Don't forget to do that. And you put a date on it. Why did my announcement not create? And now I've got this. You can actually set a date on that that will roll forward. Well, something went wrong here. Great new. Well, that's odd. I don't know why. It should give me the window to put it in. If you put dates in there, those dates will roll forward too. So if you do weekly announcements, you could do that. So think about doing that now if you have time. It might be handy to do or as you create them, put dates on them so that they will roll forward in the next term and automatically deliver to your students when you want them to, okay? Make sure you set up your own profile, your own notification settings. I will tell you from personal experience, you will likely change those notification settings after you start teaching because you'll realize more of what they do. But remember that if you want to send things to your text messaging or a private email address, you can configure those in your profiles. Final steps, Kim mentioned you do it. Run your you do it report. It's just like the link validator. If you go over to you do it and you run that report, it will tell you everything and I'll view an old report here. Well, there wasn't one. I scan the course and it will tell me things to fix with accessibility issues. And I know I've got one minute left, but Brandon went through that in great detail in the pre, one of the previous Canvas sessions. He did an awesome job. The link for all of that and the detailed explanations are in that newsletter because the recording link is in there. And so please go to that and review it. 
Uh, Brandon also has great resources in the orientation course for instructors about you do it. Review those. And as a last ditch, if you're still confused, contact Brandon. But again, he's trying to provide you with all the resources. He is our accessibility expert. He really knows it backwards and forwards. Um, make sure you've published your course when you're all in and done. And that would be up here in your upper right corner. You would have to hit the publish button. This course won't show for students until it's published. Okay, so make sure you do that. And then you're ready to import. Import is super simple. But remember, import doesn't delete anything already in the course. Import adds to it, right? So don't import more than once, or you're going to have a mess. So you just choose import, you select one, and we're going to have a session on this, so I'm not going into great detail. Copy a Canvas course, you choose the course, which um, I have access to a million courses because I'm a designer, but I can choose that course. I can choose all content or specific content. Again, we'll talk about that in another session. And then I just import. You go into your empty course and copy into, I shouldn't really use, it's import or copy into the empty term course. If you muff up your provision term course, send an email to instructional design. You can't fix it yourself. We can't fix it ourselves. No, you shouldn't do the delete. You can, no, I mean, you should, they, oh, they do that. They, they'll they fix it. Board. There is a reset button. I would only use that on your sandbox, nowhere else. And I think the reset button will be gone for you because we really don't want faculty to reset that to zero because it will wipe out everything, the template, formatting. it'll be all the formatting, it'll all be gone. So if you have a problem for the time being, send an email to instructional design. I expect that we will have some forthcoming information about a specific procedure. We don't know if it's going to be the contact help desk or what, but for now, contact instructional design. We can't fix it, but we can get to the people who can. So that's for the short haul. Okay, I've run over a couple minutes. <clears throat> I thank everybody for being here. I do have time to stay a little longer if anybody has some questions as we wrap up. Any questions from your, your folks, Brandon? Nope, I think I've answered all of them that I've seen. Okay, and then also remember that we have more sessions. Uh, tomorrow I'll be doing one at one o'clock, and it's uh, Canvas Health Resources for faculty and students. I don't expect that to run super long, because, but I will try to go into a little bit of detail about who, you've heard a lot of it here today, but I will go into it again in a little more detail. And then coming up after that on the 20th will be Brandon with a ses session on how to communicate in Canvas. And then there will be one on Canvas backup import and, and uh, Canvas backup and import on the 20th and I will be doing that one. And then Amy will be doing one on the 21st about finalizing the grade book. And again, plug in that newsletter. Right here is the whole list. It will tell you where the presentations are, who's streaming, and it will give you some information about each one of those. As the recordings are completed, those links will be back in here also, and uh, any other resource materials we think you need. Thank you all for attending. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs>